Good afternoon and, and welcome to this Churchill This Day webcast uh, broadcast uh, live here from America's National Churchill Museum at Westminster College uh, on this the 21st of December uh, 2020. Uh, we are uh, really delighted today to be joined uh, by the director uh, of the Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, Library and Museum, Paul Sparrow. Paul is with us today uh, to help us uh, understand and talk about a very, very important meeting uh, that occurred between Winston Churchill and President Roosevelt uh, at the end of 1941, December 1941, that, that famous visit uh, that Churchill uh, paid to Roosevelt in the White House uh, beginning uh, on tomorrow, the anniversary of, the, of his arrival, I believe, is, is tomorrow uh, in 1941. So, Paul, uh, thank you very much for being with us and taking time out of your holiday season uh, to join us to talk about this remarkable uh, visit between these two great leaders. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Tim. It's an honor to be here, and I'm very excited to talk about this. It's a, it really is an extraordinary and historic uh, visit. Uh, between two of the most important uh, people in the 20th century and arguably one of the most important friendships uh, in the history of Western world. I, you know, I, I agree. And, and, and this is a friendship that had not started or did not start that, 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 that December visit in 1941. Uh, President Roosevelt and Churchill had met on several occasions uh, prior. Um, you, before the, we went live, you were talking about the Atlantic Charter as being a, a seminal moment. And I think I, I agree that was a, a very important moment. But even earlier, uh, the two men had met. Uh, and uh, although Churchill didn't remember it, uh, he, didn't, he didn't seem to remember uh, President Roosevelt, didn't leave an impression. But um, uh, they met at the Atlantic Charter, which was also a, a very seminal moment in, in the history of the alliance and strategic alliance, wasn't it, Paul? Well, it's an extraordinary moment when you think about it because uh, you know, the United States is still not in the war, but FDR is doing everything he can to try to support Great Britain. Um, and they, they decide they have to meet secretly. Uh, and it was in August and every August FDR would take vacation. So he told the press and everyone that he was going on a fishing trip off, off the coast of New England. And he had the presidential yacht and he's cruising up and down the coastline and waving to people. Uh, and then the presidential yacht pulled out into the ocean. He got into a cutter. It took him over to the Augusta uh, cruiser. Uh, meanwhile, one of his crewmen put on the hat and got the cigarette holder and rolled around in a wheelchair and waved to everybody on the beach. Everybody thought he was still on the presidential yacht. Uh, meanwhile, of course, Churchill was coming across the Atlantic uh, and Roosevelt arrived uh, in the Bay first in Newfoundland. And you can just sort of imagine the scene. It's a foggy day and, you know, the giant Prince of Wales comes out of the fog and drops anchor and Churchill is piped aboard and the two of them, you know, really essentially come to face to face for the first time. And that really established their relationship as uh, FDR later told uh, this, uh, um, one of his cousins, Daisy Sukli, that uh, we had lunch together and it really sort of solidified our friendship. I think he's quite right. So it, it was a, the first time the two military teams had gotten together, but more importantly, it was the moment when they really first bonded as friends. Right. And, 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 and before that and even after that, um, the correspondence that went back and forth between London and Washington uh, was 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 rapid, uh, was was uh, constant. And in, in, in many ways, Churchill was was trying to woo uh, Roosevelt famously to to get him uh, to lend some aid and support uh, to 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 the war effort uh, that that, you know, London and Britain was standing alone virtually uh, for, for such a long time. And then December 7th happened, December 7th, 1941, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and, and, and that changed things, that changed things dramatically uh, and instantly uh, for, for, for the relationship, didn't it, Paul? It's an extraordinary moment when you think about that. It's a Sunday afternoon, uh, FDR is sitting in his oval study with uh, Harry Hopkins, one of his closest advisors who actually lived in the White House, the FDR was playing with his stamps. Um, and although you know everyone was on high alert, they knew that there was an imminent attack from Japan, no one really thought they were going to attack Pearl Harbor. So when the news first came in, FDR was shocked, uh, as were other people. Um, and this quickly became the worst day of his life. I mean, he loved the US Navy. Uh, he was there during World War I when he was assistant secretary of the Navy when the keel was laid for the USS Arizona. 
Uh, he knew many of the captains of these ships. He was deeply involved with the Navy. So this was the, the worst day in his life. Um, and you know, he had to prepare and meet with congressional leaders and military leaders. Uh, and of course, there was uh, the notification of Churchill himself, who of course immediately wanted to declare war. Uh, and, and FDR was trying to you know, understand what the right process should be in going forward. Uh, but in that crisis day, um, at, at the worst possible moment, um, he calls his assistant in, Grace Tully, and says, I need to make an address to Congress tomorrow. Um, I'd like you to take this down. And as she describes it in her autobiography, he leaned back and took a long drag on a cigarette and then dictated the entire first draft of the Day of Infamy speech off the top of his head, complete with punctuation without taking a stop. Um, and if you think about that, that's pretty extraordinary. Right, and, and, and for Churchill, uh, who was, was, was celebrating um, a birthday, he was actually celebrating uh, Kathleen uh, Harriman's 24th birthday at Checkers, the right. country estate for the prime minister. Uh, and the BBC broadcast uh, announced the news. Interestingly enough, they waited to the end of the broadcast to, 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 to announce Pearl Harbor. Uh, and and, it, and clearly, um, Churchill stood up and, and knew the meaning uh, of that and wanted desperately, uh, and, and, and his first thought was to, to, to contact Washington and to talk to Roosevelt yep. uh, and find out what, what's happening. And um, that's when President Roosevelt said uh, famously, you know, we're in the same boat now. Uh, and, 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 and it was that moment, that horrific moment uh, of tragedy on, on December 7th, 1941, that, that really started to catapult um, you know, the itinerary forward for, for this visit later in December that we're, we're here to talk about today. Uh, and, and Churchill you know, steamed across the Atlantic uh, once again, uh, this time on the, the, the Duke of York, uh, the Prince of Wales, the famous ship had, had recently been torpedoed. Yeah. or bombed and, and, and lost. It was, a, it was a huge blow for the Brits. Uh, but the sister ship, the Duke of York, shuttled uh, Churchill uh, over to uh, Virginia, uh, to uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, uh, where, where Churchill disembarked and then flew the 177 miles to Washington, where FDR met him at the tarmac. He met him yeah. at the airfield, which was unusual. And, and, and I think um, you know, Churchill had, had, had said, don't, don't, don't bother, don't, don't do it, but he did. Uh, which was, I think, another symbol of of that relationship was was FDR going the extra mile to actually greet the prime minister uh, when he he made that trip on the 22nd of December, uh, 1941. Uh, but the next day was when 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 the two men really started to show um, their their bond to the world uh, at that that famous press conference at the White House uh, on the 23rd. I, I think it's an extraordinary moment to see these two great leaders, both of whom uh, had a great respect for and familiarity with the press and the media and, and knew how to use it when, when they needed to. And I think that was on full display uh, on, on, on the 23rd, wasn't it, Paul? It was, and, and people who watch uh, presidential press conferences these days really don't understand what, what FDR did with his press conferences. He held 997 press conferences during the course of his 12 years as president. You think about that, it's an extraordinary number. Uh, but in his day, the press conferences, he would just open the door to the Oval Office and the press would just stream in and surround him at his desk. Um, and uh, there's photographs of them sitting on his desk and taking notes on, the, uh, on, on his White House desk. Um, and so on this day, uh, there was a huge number of people who wanted to get in. Uh, and so there was some, some delay in processing, you know, uh, Prior to the start of the war, there was a fairly free flow of journalists and people in and out of the Oval Office. But you know, at this point, they uh, they were trying to be a little bit more uh, secure in terms of who got in. And right at the beginning of the press conference, uh, Roosevelt says this: um, uh, "I'm sorry to have taken so long for all of you to get in, but apparently, I was telling the Prime Minister uh, the object was to prevent a wolf from coming in in sheep's clothing." The reporters all laughed, uh, but I. Uh, Thereby, uh, ring my metaphors because it was suggested to me this morning that if, if he came to this uh, conference, he would have to be prepared to meet the American press, who compared with the British press, uh, as was my experience in the old days, the wolves compared with the British press lambs. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I, I, I sort of, you know, he, FDR always had a sense of humor uh, and he tried to um, 
bring the press in. So the reporters loved FDR because he was always good copy. He treated them with respect. He would often in these press conferences say, now that's off the record, you can't use that. Um, and if someone had printed something he didn't like, he would call them out on it. Uh, but it really was a give and take. And on any given day, uh, you know, it could be quite extraordinary. And as the questions come around to Churchill, um, he says, uh, do you think the war is turning in our favor in the last month or so? Remember, this is December 1941. That The war has been going terribly. It's been a disaster for Great Britain. And he says, uh, I can't describe the feeling of relief with which I find Russia's victories of the United States and Great Britain standing side by side. It is incredible to anyone who has lived through the lonely months of 1940. It is incredible. Thank God. So I think that really sums up the way Churchill felt at that moment that finally America had come into the war. And you have to understand that that period of 1941, uh, prior to Pearl Harbor, late 1940 through 1941, the British were desperate to get America involved in the war. Uh, and Roosevelt was very reluctant. He didn't think the American public were ready yet. Uh, he had campaigned in 1940 for the unprecedented third term in office by saying, you know, our boys will not fight in this war unless we are attacked. Um, and right. so even though he was giving them destroyers for bases and, you know, lend lease program and doing everything he could uh, within and sometimes without the bounds of the law, uh, the Ameri he didn't feel the American public were ready. But on December 7th, all that changed. All opposition to American intervention and American participation in the war ended, and he was able to wholeheartedly uh, come into the war as a major ally. Yes, and I think it was also at that that, that press conference. Uh, and I, I think you're right. Churchill walked into that, uh, and FDR in some ways set it up wonderfully for Winston Churchill, uh, who 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 stepped right in and, and and made the most of it, and 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 used his sense of humor, uh, used his own wit uh, with with the crowd. For instance, he was asked, I think, by one of the reporters, um, you know, how long to victory? You know, how long can we expect to victory? And Winston Churchill famously said, well. Um, only half as long as if we do it badly. <laughs> so, you know, he, 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 he um, and of course there was laughter when, when he said that. So Churchill uh, knew that, and it really did set the stage, uh, that, that press conference for, for things to come. You know, the, the next day was Christmas Eve uh, uh, in 1941. Uh, and that was a day that found Winston Churchill and FDR um, in an alliance in another way. They were famously lighting the, the White House Christmas tree. Uh, and, it, and it's at that, that occasion where Churchill makes uh, a brilliant speech. You know, he, his Christmas message of 1941. Uh, and I'll read a part of it here. He, he starts by saying, you know, I spend, the, and some of these words strike home in 2020, if, if you listen to them. He said, I spend my anniversary in festival far from my country, far from my family, yet I can truthfully say that I feel, uh, I do not feel far from home. Uh, and, and, and he talks about his, his mother's heritage, uh, his, his, she was American, she was from Brooklyn. Uh, in many ways, you know, this was coming home uh, and America was always considered to a certain degree by Churchill as, as, as a kindred uh, country uh, because of his, his family. Uh, and he concludes that speech in a very optimistic way uh, and, and despite uh, you know, the darkness of the day and, and the hour and the long um, trial of 1940 uh, and into 1941 and after Pearl Harbor, uh, he says to everyone, let the children have their night of fun and laughter. Let the gifts of Father Christmas delight their play. Let us grown-ups share to the full in their uh, unstinted pleasures before we turn again to the stern task and the formidable years that lie before us. Resolved that by our sacrifice and daring, these same children shall not be robbed of their inheritance or denied their right to live in a free and decent world. And, and, and he says, happy Christmas to all. I mean, it's an extraordinary speech yeah. um, and, and, and shows Churchill's just latent sense of optimism uh, at that moment. And it, it's important to remember that Britain had been being bombed for almost 18 months at this point. You know, the, the, the Blitz, uh, especially in late 1940, early 1941, was pretty devastating uh, to England. And uh, the church bells were silent. Uh, they did not ring until 1945. Um, the, every house had to have blackout curtains. Uh, there were no 
lights in the street. There, there were no exterior celebrations. There were no Christmas tree lights in, in London. It was a dark, dreary, and badly damaged city. So to come to Washington and to see the symbolic lighting of the tree, the symbolic birth of Christ, of a new era, I mean, it was very powerful. And I think it really moved at the, uh, Churchill enormously. And I think it was, again, one of these moments that bonded them. Uh, and of course, the, the humorous postscript is that uh, um, FDR always considered himself a tree grower. Uh, and part of what they did at the property here in Hyde Park was grow trees. And uh, in Christmas 1943, FDR had a Christmas tree sent to Winston Churchill in London, or I guess to his home um, uh, at uh, um, Checkers. No, the other one. and uh, Charwell, right. And, and Charwell, right, and had a Christmas tree sent to him uh, because they didn't really have Christmas trees in England at that point because of all of the restrictions and rations. So, you know, it really was a, a bonding moment for the two of them. And, and for Churchill, and it was not widely known at the time at all, but it was during that ceremony that Churchill experienced some heart palpitations. Yeah. Uh, and this was a sign of things to come, as, as, as those who are familiar with his visit know. Uh, but um, he, he spoke, Churchill, that is, uh, spoke with his physician, uh, Lord Morin, who is with him on the visit, uh, and said, I, I think I, 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 I felt some palpitations. Uh, and um, you know, he, he couldn't let the world know uh, that, that at this seminal moment uh, that he, he had any sign of, of, of weakness or, or ill health. Uh, so it was kept very, very quiet. Um, and, and, uh, but that was something that occurred during that ceremony, um, which, was, which was not widely known at the time. Now, of course, just two days later, um, Churchill had the extraordinary honor of speaking to a joint session of Congress, the first British prime minister to ever do so, one of the first war, uh, foreign leaders to ever address the Congress in that way. And it was a sort of extraordinary moment because of course, most Americans had been following the story of what had been going on. They'd heard his radio broadcasts, you know, never have so many owed so much to help you. I mean, his, his uh, oratory had become legend. Uh, and so there was tremendous anticipation uh, of the speech. Uh, and I think, you know, as you commented earlier, he, he started by trying to win his audience over. Yes, he did. Oh, yeah, he, 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 he played up his American roots. And he talked about, um, he knew his audience. He, he knew that he, he cited his mother uh, with American heritage and famously said if his father had been uh, American and not his mother, he might have gotten to the, the, the U.S. Congress on his own, uh, famously, to, to laughter uh, within, within the joint session. Uh, but what he says after that is interesting too. He he, he notes that um, you know even if that had happened, uh, he would not have been invited uh, by unanimously by everyone. If if he had been elected to Congress, uh, he certainly would have had some enemies on on one or side of the aisle or the other. Uh, so he thought it was much better to be invited the way he was. It was an extraordinary uh, moment. And in that speech, you know, he 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 in typical Churchillian fashion tells the American people uh, uh, that it's not going to be easy going forward. You know, there are battles to come, he says. This is not it. Pearl Harbor is not the, 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 the first of our, of our tests and trials, and there will be more to come. And together, um, we can, uh, through our alliance, overcome these obstacles. Uh, but you know, he was very frank uh, and very forthright uh, in that, but optimistic. Uh, he also, uh, interestingly enough, warned that um, and reflected uh, that you know after the First World War, um, if and this is Churchill lamenting, I think the fact that if the United States and Great Britain had had worked together at that time, perhaps they wouldn't be in the situation yeah. they are now, which was a very bold thing to say. Uh, to, to 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 say you know we could have avoided this, and it's actually similar to what he said in his famous Iron Curtain speech here. At Westminster College, uh, he warned of of the last time in World War II. He warned that no one no one would do anything. So perhaps that would avoid World War III. So he's he's using this pattern in this speech that he he does from time to time to, to preserve the peace, uh, which is an extraordinary statement. I think one of the things about both of these leaders was that they uh, always respected their audience by telling them the truth, even the hard truth. Um, right. They never backed off of being realistic. Um, some of the speeches that FDR gave in the early days of the Depression when he first became president, 
are really quite extraordinary in trying to lay out the enormous challenges that America faced. And again, once we got into the war, it was very similar. And of course, Churchill never sugarcoated what he had to say. Um, but later on in the speech, one of the things that, uh, that Churchill did that's really quite remar remarkable he's, is he's talking about uh, the Japanese attack. And he says, quote, after the outrages they have committed upon us at Pearl Harbor in the Pacific Islands, in the Philippines, in Malaya, and the Dutch East Indies, they must now know that the stakes for which they have decided to play are mortal. And then he goes on to say, what kind of people do they think we are? Is it possible that they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget? You know, right. and both Churchill and Roosevelt always exuded that sort of, in the end, we will win. We will persevere. Right. Uh, and I think it's a powerful sentiment uh, that helped maintain morale while being honest about the situation. Yeah, and and you know, I it, I love the way that the, the speech famously ended too, to to great applause. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's always Churchill is a great closer. I mean, his the last lines of his speeches uh, always have a, are rousing, and this one is is one of his best. He, I mean, he he ends by saying, still I avow my hope and faith, sure and inviolate, that in the days to come, the British and American peoples will, for their own safety and the goodwill of all, walk together in majesty and justice and in peace. And then he famously sits right down and everyone else stands right up to great applause. It, 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 it's a great ending to, to a great speech. Uh, he was a great orator, and, I, and it, it's interesting because there's a lot of competition between the two of them regarding their speeches, and they often commented on each other's speeches or radio broadcasts. Uh, you know, very good job last night on that speech. Um, and uh, but you know, they they took very different approaches. You know, there is an eloquence, there is an, uh, a, a component of of literary reference and and quality to Churchill speeches. Uh, whereas FDR was much more down to earth. He tried to use language uh, that, that the common man, the forgotten man would understand. Uh, and he often tried to put things in the context of either a biblical reference uh, that he thought his audience would understand or using simple analogies uh, that people could comprehend very quickly. Like when he came up with the Lend-Lease program, you know, he described it by saying, well, imagine if your neighbor's house was on fire and they came over to borrow your garden hose. You wouldn't sell them the garden hose. You'd give them the garden hose. And then if they damaged it, they would buy you a new one. Um, and it, it sort of instantly creates an understanding of what he was trying to do. Uh, and I think that you see that time and time again um, in his speeches. Uh, and and with, with, as with Winston Churchill, he's constantly re raising the oratorical standard uh, to true art form. You know, and, and on that score, you know, shortly after this joint speech by the British Prime Minister, um, President Roosevelt gave a State of the Union yeah. uh, not long after. Um, you know, how did how did those two speeches interplay, or, or did, did 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 Roosevelt react to this or play upon it, or or how you know? They, Absolutely, you I mean, a little bit. I mean, the gauntlet was thrown down, right? I mean, Churchill rocked the house, you know, and, and his speech was a, this astounding success. And I think, you know, uh, Roosevelt felt like he had to, you know, um, up his game a little bit to do it. Um, but the, the thing about that speech, uh, the, the State of the Union speech on January 6, 1942, uh, was that he laid out a vision for what America was going to do. Um, and he made some statements that were considered just shocking and, and impossible, uh, particularly regarding uh, the industrial capacity of the United States. So he says, he, this is what he says at one point, uh, I just sent a letter uh, of directive to, to the appropriate departments and agencies of our government ordering the immediate steps to be taken to increase our production rate of airplanes so rapidly that in this year, 1942, we shall produce 60,000 planes. They had produced 300 the year before. 60,000 planes, 10,000 more than the goal set a year and a half ago. This includes 43,000 combat planes, bombers, dive bombers, pursuit planes. The rate of increase will be continued so that next year, 1943, we shall produce 125,000 airplanes. He goes on to dictate how many tanks they're going to make, how many, and, and his, his entire staff and the military the hierarchy are just 
they're stunned because there's no way they thought we could possibly accomplish this. Um, they were going to, he was talking about producing double what the entire Axis forces were producing. Um, and in fact, they surpassed those numbers. Um, but it was a way for him to say, this is what we are going to do. Um, and it was a concrete commitment uh, to the full American involvement in this war. This idea of the arsenal of democracy um, you know, was, was a very real thing. The United States was essentially keeping uh, both uh, Russia and the United Kingdom alive in this war by providing them with the war materials that they desperately needed, particularly ships. Shipping was keeping Great Britain alive, literally, uh, and the, Ru the Germans were sinking more ships than we could build at first. Uh, but of course, by the end of the 1943, Americans were turning out one ship a day. Uh, so that you know, the idea of this industrial might um, being applied very, very effectively and very, very judiciously, uh, that, that marker was really put down in his speech. And I think you know, it, it's hard to, to understand exactly the fear uh, that permeated the world at this point. Uh, because particularly in 19, end of 1941, beginning of 1942, all the way through 1942, in fact, it, the outcome was not fixed. I mean, the, the Nazis were winning everywhere. The Japanese were winning right. everywhere. Um, and at one point, the German army were 30 miles outside of Moscow. Um, and until Guadalcanal, the Japanese had not been defeated in a single battle. Uh, so you, you, know, you have to understand that people really had a tremendous fear that there was a possibility that we were going to see the end of democracy and the rise of fascism all around the world. Right. And it, 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 it was um, a true testament you know, to, to, to the American military or uh, to the, not only the military plant mobilizing, uh, but the industrial capacity uh, to mobilize and change and, and adapt. Um, and it famously really did change the outcome uh, of the war. I, I'd like to just intercede a little bit here and, and remind people that for those of you who are tuning in uh, on, our, on our Facebook or our YouTube channels, uh, we'll be happy to take questions. Uh, a couple of them are, are trickling in here. Uh, if you have questions for uh, our, our distinguished guest here, uh, we're happy to take them. So I encourage you to, uh, to ask now and, and we'll, we'll get around to that as, as, as we continue our discussion uh, today. Uh, you know, I, I'd also like to, well, go ahead, Paul. I was just gonna say, you know, the parallel to the sort of friendship that was evolving between Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, of course, there was a military conference going on here, the Arcadia Conference, um, where the, the, the two sides were trying to uh, get together and plot out a strategy. And of course, famously, Winston Churchill didn't travel in small groups. Uh, he had more than 86 uh, personal aides and adjutants and military advisors and everything. And he took over what had been the Monroe Room at the White House and turned it into his map room, uh, where right. all the latest information was coming in with secure communications from military uh, leaders all over the world. And he could keep track of everything that was going on. And when Roosevelt saw this, he was really quite, you know, uh, jealous that he didn't have one. So of course, as soon as Churchill left, FDR created a map room in the White House, um, uh, which became essentially now what's what we call, uh, you know, the Situation Room. Uh, but it was the first time that he brought all of the information, and that's one of the reasons we have such an extraordinarily good record of all of the military communications is that everything involving the President of the United States went through this one room. So there's copies of everything. Right. Well, and also as part of the conference, part of this this visit, uh, there was, uh, and also the creation and understanding of, of a couple of really important things. And first was that um, there was a, an expressed in writing um, agreement that there would be a Germany first policy by the United States. I think it had yeah. always been understood and implicitly le, le, le known that the United States would aid in uh, in the European theater first, even though uh, weeks earlier the Japanese had, had, had attacked Pearl Harbor. But there was an understanding um, from this conference that that uh, in writing uh, that the, the, the European theater would be be be, be the first emphasis. Uh, but also out of the Arcadia conference came uh, the combined chiefs of staff committee. Uh, which was really, really important and critical, really, for the communication to have a joint chiefs of staff and, and the sharing of intelligence, the sharing of, of strategy from, from, from day one. Um, that was also a critical outcome of this, this conference. 
It's also the first time you see the uh, shadow of disagreement between the two sides, uh, because the British, who had admittedly been fighting, you know, the Nazis for you know a year and a half, uh, almost two years, uh, uh, understood what a formidable foe they were, uh, and the Americans wanted to immediately invade France. You know, let's go right at them. Let's let's land troops in France and start fighting there. And the British said, no, that's not a particularly good idea. Why don't we invade North Africa? Uh, and right. this debate between the two of them would rage for most of 1942 until finally Roosevelt sided with the British and said, no, we're going to North Africa, overruled all his own generals. And of course, they landed, Operation Torch landed in North Africa and Morocco uh, in November of 42. But that debate about when we're going to land in Europe, when are we going to get the fight into Europe, when are we going to take the fight to Hitler, uh, remained a contentious point between them right up until the end of 1943, really, and the Tehran Conference. Right, I know. And um, it, it really is, uh, looking back, you know, uh, th 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 this visit laid the groundwork for a lot of these decisions and, and, and communications. Um, there's also a, a famous story, a, a more humorous note, that uh, is often told uh, about this visit uh, that has nothing to do with the conference or statesmanship necessarily, but underscores uh, the, the, the personal relationship between these two great leaders. Uh, and the um, uh, it's, it's the famous um, uh, bathroom incident, mm -hmm. I, if, if, I, if I might. Uh, and and you, I'll let you tell the story, Paul. It's, it's a terrific one. Well, you know, one of the points of this conference was that they wanted to try to create a coalition of allies um, to to launched this global war. And they had been going back and forth, what are we gonna call this alliance? You know, the allies is not really a strong thing. And uh, FDR had this sort of brainstorm. Um, uh, why don't we call it the United Nations? And he was so excited about this that he rolled his wheelchair down the hall and burst into the, the prime minister's uh, room. And the prime minister had just gotten out of the bath uh, and was dictating uh, to his assistant and was essentially naked. Uh, the towel had fallen off and Churchill was somewhat famous for a, a lack of, um, shall we say, uh, privacy. Um, and Roosevelt, of course, was mortified and very embarrassed. He said, oh, please excuse me, Mr. Prime Minister, I, I'm sorry. I, and he starts to wheel out of the room and the Prime Minister is alleged to have said, um, the Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. Now, we actually, we actually know that this incident did occur uh, because Churchill's valet uh, wrote about it uh, and in his uh, diaries, uh, we actually had it on exhibit for, uh, on loan from the Churchill archives when we did our exhibit on D-Day. So we know that the, the event actually happened. We're not sure that he, those are the exact words that Churchill uttered, but uh, it certainly is a, it's a humorous uh, incident in otherwise a very serious period. And, and, and Churchill himself um, never admitted outright that this happened, though I, he, he alluded to it kind of in a circumspect fashion in a conversation with the king uh, when he returned to England and, and said, uh, you know, I, I stood naked before the president, you know, and, and I think he, he might have been speaking metaphorically, but in some ways he might have been speaking uh, <laughs> uh, in, in, in truth and reality too. So, you know, it, 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 it is a, it's a great conference. And another lighter side of, of this meeting was cocktail hour. Um, and I think we'd be remiss in, in having this conversation without talking a little bit about uh, FDR's famous cocktail hours and, um, and Winston Churchill's uh, participation or lack thereof uh, in, in, in such meetings. Um, well, and maybe, yeah, go ahead. As you said, they had very different drinking habits. You know, as, as you well know, Churchill would start the day with sherry, have whiskey at lunch, champagne at dinner, or be drinking, consuming alcohol all day long. And Roosevelt really wasn't that kind of a drinker, but he had a very strict policy that around five o'clock every day was children's hour. And this started, by the way, when he was governor of New York during Prohibition. Um, but uh, and, and children's hour was a time when you were not allowed to talk work. Uh, and he would mix cocktails and serve everyone cocktails and they would gossip about Hollywood celebrities or people's children or people within the government. And it was really uh, meant to allow people to have a break and relax. Now, Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, was a teetotaler and was sort of horrified by the whole concept, but um, FDR famously would mix these drinks and uh, he got, shall we just say, a variety of reviews on the quality of his bartending skills. He was one of the greatest commander in chiefs in American history, but perhaps not the greatest bartender. 
Uh, and so he would mix these drinks up. They were uh, sort of like martinis, but he would put all sorts of weird ingredients in them. And most people, you know, President of the United States makes you a drink, you drink it. Um, Winston Churchill, however, preferred a simpler, straighter, single malt scotch um, or, or whiskey when he was drinking. So uh, he would famously, uh, FDR would pour him a drink uh, and then he would excuse himself to go to the bathroom, pour it out, have his aide fill his glass up with whiskey and come back into the room. At least that's the story. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. And, and sometimes he would fill the, the glass up with, uh, keep the olives, uh, but put water in the glass uh, instead. Uh, that's that's uh, another take on that, that famous story. Um, Going back to, to another matter that we alluded to earlier, I talked about um, the heart palpitations that Churchill had during the Christmas Eve speech. Um, you know, after the joint session speech on the 26th, uh, that night, you know, it was rather warm in the White House and Churchill had, you know, been, been uh, very happy and pleased with the way the joint session speech went. Uh, but it was, was a bit warm and he, he got out of bed and, and tried to open the window in the White House, which was by all accounts stiff and a little bit stuck. And as he did so, he felt this very sharp pain in his chest and down his left arm. And um, it, was, it, was, it was not debilitating by any means, but it was, it was a scare. Uh, and uh, you know, he, the next day uh, he met with his physician, uh, Lord Moran, who had accompanied him again to the trip. And uh, it just described the symptoms and uh, it became clear that Churchill had a, a, a mild heart attack. Um, and, you know, the, the, the standard procedure was, you know, six weeks off your feet, you know, recoup, relax, not a stressful schedule. And that was anything but what the itinerary showed. Uh, and even Lord Moran in his, his diaries um, notes that he knew what was going on, but, um, there was almost an unwritten dance between the two men as they were having this conversation uh, that, that was serious, but they couldn't really call it what it was. Uh, and they didn't. Uh, and and, and he, he kept that at, at, at bay. So, you know, not only are, are we talking about uh, you know, an incredible speech writer, uh, oratory, uh, cocktail parties, a heart attack, uh, you know, it's Christmas tree lighting. It, it, it's an incredible visit on so many levels with full of, uh, of, 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 of almost intrigue and drama. You almost couldn't write a, a, a play about this. Uh, a, a, although there is one being written, I understand it'll be uh, called Allies uh, about this subject uh, to be, to be displayed in, in London in, tw in, in 2022. So we'll, we'll see more of this great incident. There's, there's another interesting uh, uh, parallel story that's happening simultaneously, which involves Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, now, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, had, had many issues with Frank, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's policies, uh, but she was very protective of him. She really did want to make sure that he took care of himself. And Winston Churchill was just an unmitigated disaster for FDR's health because Winston Churchill uh, would get up in the morning and start drinking, uh, and then in the middle of the afternoon, take a two or three hour nap every day. And during that period, of course, FDR had to work, you know, that's when he got his presidential work done. And then he would go back to being with Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill would stay up till two or three o'clock in the morning, smoking cigars, drinking heavily, you know, doing all sorts of things that were really bad for FDR. Um, and this would go on day after day. And Eleanor was very upset uh, that Winston Churchill wasn't taking into account the extraordinary workload that her husband had to do in addition to entertaining Winston Churchill, which was a full-time job for anyone. Um, and of course the, uh, the war itself took a tremendous toll on both these men and their health was really considered a state secret. Uh, and everyone knew that FDR had polio uh, and he was lame, but very few Americans knew that he was completely paralyzed from the waist down. And certainly as the war went on and his health deteriorated, you know, the White House did everything they could to prevent people from understanding and learning how sick he really was. And the same was true of Winston Churchill. Uh, I think the Tehran conference sort of is the turning point, certainly for FDR. He never really recovers. You know, 1944, he's sick most of the year. And, you know, after the, um, the conference uh, in Yalta, he dies six weeks later. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the stress, the incredible pressure these men were under uh, really took a toll on both of them. And it, it, essentially FDR died, you know, in office because of the war. Right, right. And um, 
we have one question here, and I think a couple of questions coming in. Um, one is uh, has to do with empire uh, and and the British uh, the perception in the American people uh, about fighting for the empire and its allies. Um, the, 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 the you know should the Americans come in to save uh, you know a system of government that perhaps maybe they fought uh, many centuries before to, to, to be apart from uh, the British Empire. Uh, and, and maybe you can speak to, to, to the president's own uh, feelings uh, about this, because I know that it was definitely a concern of, of Americans to look at, at the Brits as, as, as imperialists. Um, and, and, and how was the American sentiment, particularly in the White House, with that, that issue? Well, this goes to the, the, the central disagreement between the two men. Uh, FDR felt very, very strongly that we were fighting for the future of democracy, not to preserve the British Empire. Uh, and there's a document that we have that's really quite extraordinary. As I was saying, they were trying to come up with the, idea, the name for this coalition, and they came up with the United Nations. And then that name was carried on after the war to talk about the diplomatic peacekeeping mission. But during the war, they were the United Nations. Uh, and Churchill uh, made a list of the countries that were going to be in this United Nations. And at the top, it says Union of Soviet Soviet Republic, China, um, United States, uh, and the United Kingdom. And then under the, under the United Kingdom, sort of inset, it says Canada, Australia, Canada, India, you know, New Zealand. Um, and then the list, alphabetically, the list of the other countries on the left-hand column. And he gives this list to FDR. Uh, and you can see FDR taking a pencil and he takes Australia and taking it out from under the United Kingdom and puts a line over to the A area. And he takes Canada and draws a strong line over to C. And he takes India and draws a strong line over to I and New Zealand. And he's saying, no, these countries do not fall under uh, the United Kingdom. These are independent countries in the United Nations. And it's just such a visual manifestation of how strongly FDR felt about the fact that this was not a war uh, to preserve the uh, British Empire. It was, in fact, a war to end the British Empire. Right. And to preserve the common value of, of, of freedom and liberty, you know, that, that existed despite the, the, the empire. Spread right. democracy um, uh, around the world. And of course, the biggest argument they had was about India. Uh, and Churchill and FDR argued so vehemently about India that at a certain point, FDR decided he just wouldn't bring it, he couldn't bring it up anymore because it was endangering their relationship. Yeah. Well, like, like any, any, any good relationship, um, you know, they have their disagreements and moments, but they work through it. Uh, they work through it and kept the greater good mm -hmm. uh, at heart, which is something that uh, was, was, was really in retrospect. Uh, we're all very grateful for these these two great leaders and, and great men for for working together at, at such a time. Uh, another question that has come in here, um, somewhat Scott uh, from Madison, Wisconsin, chimes in and says, "Are there any good books that you would recommend uh, that focus on this this December visit uh, for readers who want to learn more? Uh, where where would they go?" I'm curious to know what what you might suggest. Well, there's a book that was written you know, several years ago by John Meacham called uh, Franklin and Winston, which looks at their whole relationship. Um, and it's, it's one of the few books that really focuses sort of on their friendship. Um, and it's quite fascinating um, because there's such an arc uh, to their story. Um, you know, it, it starts out, you know, when, when FDR, when Winston Churchill comes in out of the wilderness and is appointed, you know, uh, uh, the Admiralty, uh, was it the First Lord of the Admiralty? Um, FDR writes him a personal letter uh, right. saying, you know, you know, because we held the same job as back in World War I, FDR was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Churchill was First Lord of the Admiralty, um, I am happy to see you come back. And if at any point you want to communicate with me directly, please do so. Basically right. bypassing all of the protocols imaginable in any government. This is the leader of the United States contacting essentially the Secretary of the Navy of, of England. Shocking, you know. Um, and then uh, Churchill responds uh, saying, yes, well, you know, and they set up this communication. Of course, Churchill signs a uh, naval person. Um, then, of right. course, then, of course, when Churchill becomes prime minister, all of his communications are signed former naval person. 
uh, right, right. I think goes to sort of some of the friendship. But you're right. There's probably seventy communications back and forth between them. Uh, you know, prior to their meeting uh, at um, uh, the Atlantic Charter. Right. And, you know, and, and in addition to, to John Meacham's great book, John Meacham is a, is a treasured Churchill fellow here. And um, um, his book is, is a terrific resource. But I would encourage anyone who's interested in the topic to look at those letters, you know, yeah. to find them reproduced. Go to the original sources and, and you'll learn um, the affection they had for one another and, and the issues and, and, and the frequency of the correspondence, that really is, is perhaps the best reading you could do is to we, read what these men, 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 men themselves wrote. We have all of their communications online, uh, the FDR uh, website, and um, uh, they're arranged uh, chronologically, uh, from those from Churchill to FDR and those from FDR to Churchill. Uh, there's also several publications that just print them all out. It's a four volume set. Um, about 2,500 communications total back and forth. And they really are fascinating, particularly once you get into the war years where every communique, you know, it'll be communique number 765 and it'll have seven different topics and you know, RE, your 623, yes, we should do this. And, you know, it, that you really get a sense of the extraordinary complexity of, of the war and what they were dealing with on so many levels. Uh, but there's also this constant sense of humor that comes out. One of my favorite communications is after uh, uh, Operation Torch and the invasion of North Africa, they decide they're gonna have this secret conference in Casablanca uh, and Churchill sends a memo, uh, it, I believe it's on January 1st saying, um, you know, we need to come up with a cover story for where, you know, I am and when I mi go missing, I think we should leak that I'm in the United States. Uh, I'll be traveling under the code name uh, Admiral Frank Land uh, and uh, you and Harry Hopkins, you need to come up with code names. Um, and FDR immediately responds back the same day uh, saying, brilliant idea, totally agree. Um, I'll be traveling under uh, Don Quixote and uh, Harry will be uh, Sancho Panza. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Churchill immediately responds back saying, what a brilliant idea, we completely confused, uh, but did you consider going under Mr. P and Admiral Q so we could mind our P's and Q's? <laughs> Sancho Panza, Don Quixote, right, right, PQ. Right, right. I mean, it, again, remember, this is the middle of a war. They're planning a secret conference and they're joking about their code names. The, the postscript to that is in, in a letter back to his wife during uh, the Casablanca conference, uh, he writes to her saying, uh, I had lunch with Don today, meaning <laughs> Don Quixote. Don Quixote, right. Michael Roosevelt. Uh, another question that's come in. Um, uh, this one uh, over YouTube uh, comes, do you think the United States entry into the war was inevitable? Uh, if Pearl Harbor hadn't forced FDR's hand, wasn't it likely uh, that it would have eventually happened some other way? It's a great question. It's a great it, it, question. Is a, it is a great question because FDR was really waiting for you know, Hitler to declare war on him. FDR did not want the Japanese to start this war. Um, and you have to remember, we had been at war in the Pacific for a year. We were, you know, depth charging submarines. They were sinking our boats. It was full out war uh, in the North Atlantic. Uh, that great movie, uh, Greyhound, that Tom Hanks just did, you know, sort of gives you a feel of what it was like being on those destroyers as they were taking right. these convoys across the North Atlantic. It was war. We were in war. We just hadn't declared war. Um, would we have, would, would Franklin Roosevelt ever have been the initiator of declaring war against Germany or Japan. I think the evidence is that he would not, uh, but he would have continued to escalate until he forced them to declare war on the United States. Right. The other question that we get sometime here is how long might Britain have held out if the United States had not gotten to war? And, and, and I, it's difficult to say, but probably not, not much longer, uh, you know, the, 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 the Industrial complex that the United States provided really did um, assist and 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 turn the tide. Certainly turned the tide. Well, you certainly, if you look at the volume of material being shipped from the United States to Great Britain uh, in 1940 and 41, it's pretty extraordinary. And the number of ships that are being sank. I mean, Germans torpedoed freighters right off the coast of Florida. Uh, you know, there's sunken right. freighters off the coast of North Carolina. They sank sank one right off the coast of Manhattan, and they were using the lights of the skyline to silhouette the freighters to torpedo them. I mean, so, you know, 
there was a there was a real war going on, but um, it's hard to know what would have happened if the United States, you know, for example, if FDR had not run in 1940 and not been elected, right. um, and you had you know uh, a less um, internationalist president of the United States with the the very powerful isolationists who were in Congress, um, the world might be a very different place today. Right. Well, in our, in our remaining time here, uh, Paul, th first of all, thank you for a, a fascinating discussion on, on an incredibly rich topic. We could probably spend the rest of the afternoon talking about this uh, and entertaining fascinating questions. Uh, but I, I want to ask, you know, how are things? You know, it, it's a tough time to be in the museum business uh, in 2020 uh, with a pandemic and closures and, and, and so forth. Uh, how are things there at Hyde Park at the FDR uh, Library and Museum? Well, we're closed uh, to the public. We closed in the middle of March and we've been closed this entire time. However, the staff has started to come back and about 50% of our staff can go back and work to, to meet our other obligations as a, a federal uh, archive. Um, and so we're, we, we try to maintain some um, uh, continuity with meeting the research requests that come in. Uh, we have inventories and other uh, processes we have to go through. And we had an exhibit that was supposed to open in uh, April, uh, FDR's final campaign about the final years of his life, a uh, final year of his life. Um, and so now we're, we're, we're working on getting that exhibit ready uh, to open when we reopen. And when will we reopen? I don't know. Um, being here in, in the state of New York, New York, of course, uh, was at the very forefront of the pandemic when it first exploded. And it was terrifying. You know, uh, the, the, we knew nothing about it. Uh, I think our governor did a great job in trying to address the issues and trying to get flatten the curve. And then for, for many months, uh, New York was really doing very, very well with a very low infection rate. And you really got the feeling that we were about to go back to normal. I had in, in September, I was predicting that we would be able to reopen the museum part time uh, by the holidays, by Christmas. And then, of course, we've seen the, the second wave come through and numbers are going up uh, and people are having to shut back down again. And I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate that people weren't willing to do some of the simpler things of social distancing and mask wearing. Uh, but I do think the vaccine is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I, I hope that all of those frontline workers uh, get vaccines as soon as possible. All right. No, no, I, 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 I hear you. And this is to, to borrow a phrase from, from uh, Roosevelt, we're in the same boat. Uh, you know, here at, at Westminster College and America's National Church and Museum, we, we closed our doors uh, suddenly and rapidly on March 15th in response to the, the pandemic and have uh, remained closed. Uh, and though we found ways to, to, again, entertain research requests and do some work with the collection, keep the staff uh, uh, engaged. Um, and we've also found ways to, to accelerate some of the construction and preservation efforts on the, on the great Church of St. Mary the Virgin Aldenbury, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the largest work in our collection. You know, it was bombed in the Blitz uh, 80 years ago. Uh, next week, actually, it was uh, December 29th. Was when the Second Great Fire of London occurred, and the church that now stands uh, here at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, was was bombed uh, in in that that darkest of, of, of nights for for the British people. Um, so we've. We've, we've allowed uh, ourselves to, 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 to make the best of it, uh, as I think we all have to, uh, in, in that true FDR and Churchillian spirit, uh, we're, we're soldiering on uh, to, to good effect. And that, so I'm glad to hear that you're, 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 you're keeping busy. And I've enjoyed your, your podcasts and webcasts and so forth coming out of, uh, of the museum, the Churchill uh, at Home series. So keep those up and, and it keeps us all uh, engaged when we can't physically come to your great uh, museum. Uh, to tune in and learn uh, about the, the rich history uh, of FDR and his impact. So keep up the good work, Paul. Well, thank you. And you too. And it's been great talking to you today. It's an, an honor and a pleasure. This is a subject I can talk about forever. And, you know, the one th good thing we can say about, uh, you know, the pandemic is that we have all been uh, encouraged and forced to take new actions to be more um, virtual and how we communicate with people. And I think, you know, that is the future. You know, we've worked hard on digitization as you have it's important that we make this material available to people all over the world. Uh, it's so hard now for people to come and visit. Uh, and it just increases the importance of digitization and, and effective search tools so that people can find what they're looking for, like all of the letters between Churchill and FDR. Right, right.
Right. And, you know, if you want the speeches or some of the speeches that we discussed today by Churchill, uh, I, I encourage you to visit our website, uh, too, which also has uh, most of the speeches, the important speeches that Churchill gave, including the Iron Curtain speech, uh, which was given 75 years ago next March. It'll be the 75th anniversary uh, of, of, that, of that seminal address uh, here at Westminster College. So we're going to find ways to commemorate and celebrate that. That, that milestone anniversary uh, next March virtually at this point too. So one of the uh, once again, thank you. One of the most important speeches uh, ever given. Yeah, well, thank you, Paul, for, for, for joining us and, and thank you all for tuning in and thank you for your questions. Um, I will note that uh, if you're interested uh, and I hope you all are that on the 29th, uh, 29th of, of this month, uh, that fateful day, the 80th anniversary of, of, of the bombing of, of the church, uh, we will be uh, webcasting a special service of lessons and carols uh, from the church, our 37th uh, such uh, service from Westminster College will be virtual this year. Uh, but in that spirit of resilience, uh, we're, we're going to continue to go forward. And uh, actually, we're, we're taping some of it right now as we speak uh, and look forward to, 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 to sharing with the world a symbol of hope and, and, and looking to a brighter 2021 uh, this place has always uh, acted as a beacon of resilience, uh, like Churchill, like FDR, and uh, we, we, we encourage you all to continue to tune in, uh, support us if you can, uh, and, 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 and thank you. And, and to everyone out there, uh, have, a, have a terrific holiday uh, and, and a happy new year. Once again, signing off here from America's National Churchill Museum at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, uh, tonight uh, or today with Paul Sparrow. Uh, we wish you a very happy Christmas.